In the early days of Mount St. Michael's, we used to go to Montana in the summer and hike up one of the mountains just outside of Missoula, south of Missoula, St. Mary's. And there was a small town called Stevensville. And in that town, there was a church. There's the old church, the old mission church. And there's something very unique about this because this church goes back to the time of the Jesuit missionaries, Father Anthony Ravallo. And I went with the seminarians and some of the boys for an outing, went up to St. Mary's, the mountain. And the next day I was looking toward having a mass and maybe having mass at the old church, the old mission church. And I went into the uh, rectory. There was an older priest there, and I was not going to beat around the bush, as they say. I just said I'm a traditional Catholic priest. I offer the Latin Mass. I'm not associated with the diocese. And I like to have Mass over at the old church there. He said, why don't you come on? We'll sit down and talk. Couldn't hurt. He was very curious. I'm sure he's heard about traditional priests. And I think this was his first encounter with a traditional priest. He said, I'd like to tell you something about the Latin Mass. He said he saw a documentary on National Geographic, and they're talking about the development of man and how man became more and more cultured and developed. And National Geographic, this secular institution, <clears throat> said that man reached this peak of culturization in the Middle Ages. And this old priest said, I couldn't believe it. But in this documentary, they exemplified the height of man's culture by a pontifical high mass. He saw the bishop, and the bishop, when he offers a mass pontifically, he not only wears a chasuble, but he also wears the dogmatic of a deacon and the tunic of a subdeacon. So if you see me sweating up here, you know what's happening. He said it was just amazing that National Geographic would show such a thing. They had the incense, the Gregorian chant, deacon, subdeacon, assistant, priest, mitre, crozier. And obviously they wanted to make it enhanced like Hollywood sometimes does, sometimes, often does. But he said it was just an amazing thing that they would recognize the height of man's culturization in the solemn high mass, and the Gregorian chant, and the significance and the beauty of it. When we offer mass pontifically, it also reminds us of the hierarchy of the church. It also reminds us, too, that our faith today in 2017 is the same faith as it was at the time of the apostles and their successors. In the catacombs, we see the burial places of the early Christians, the catacombs of St. Calixtus have the early popes exactly in the succession that we read in our books. They had bishops, they had priests, they had deacons, subdeacons, acolytes, exorcists, lectors, porters, the very minor orders and major orders that are in the Catholic Church today. And so, not to get off the topic I just wanted to share with you is a very beautiful and very significant expression of our faith as we offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and do it most solemnly. We also like to remind those young, young men here and boys of the great privilege it is to be a priest. As you know, our Lord said this Amongst his apostles, the harvest is indeed as great, but the laborers are few. We need priests, and we need them now. Obviously, there's a period of six years of training, but your vocation is something that you should pray about. What does God want me to do? I find it amazing. I, I have people write to me and say, you know what, Bishop? We need priests, you know. I'm like, you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I 
our priest in the Midwest are driving sometimes 16, 17 hours offering multiple masses in Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, and we definitely need priests. So remember that if God calls you, it is a great privilege to be a priest, to represent Christ and to act in his in his, main, in his name and in his person. That's the reason why the priest, when he takes the host and the chalice, he does not say, this is the body, this is Christ's body. He says, this is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. All of you parents especially pray for your children that they may know their vocation and have the grace to follow it. But what our Lord give is a solution. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers into his harvest. And this is a part of all of us here in the church. We see the beautiful stained glass window of St. Teresa of the Little Flower. And below her are Jesuit missionaries dressed up in parkas like Eskimos. Because St. Teresa was the special patronage, patroness of the, this Northwest Territory of the Jesuits. And she, from her cloistered Carmelite convent, was a great missionary by her prayers and her sacrifices, as Our Lady said at Fatima. This morning I'd like to speak briefly about that beautiful prayer that we say, the rosary. <clears throat> Been in the church for over 900 years. <clears throat> when we think of Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima and at Lourdes, our Blessed Mother encouraged the Holy Rosary. There is no doubt in my mind that if we devoutly pray the Marosi, meditate on its mysteries, this will be our powerful means of perseverance in these times. It's interesting sometimes talking to different people who come to recognize what's going on in the church, the apostasy, and knowing that something's wrong and it was started, all began with the praying of the rosary or wearing the brown scapular. I'm always amazed when I talk to Protestants who say that, oh, you Catholics don't believe in the Bible. Oh, really? I was sitting next to a Baptist on the way out to, from Omaha to Denver. And, uh, excuse me, not Denver to Las Vegas. I hate to even say that word. I, it's a cheaper flight and a better time, so. Uh, Sin City there. But he asked me what I was praying. Well, I said, this is my breviary. I pray every day the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms, and the church divides up those 150 Psalms to the seven days of the week. And then I said, and each day is divided up into hours at what time you pray these Psalms, you know, ideally. Then I went past that, and I said, here's the scriptural readings we read every day. And then after that, we have the lives of the saints, those holy men and women who followed Christ most perfectly. I know he was staring at my book because he couldn't read the Latin. He's like, what in the world is that? But the beautiful thing is that it planted a seed in his mind. He reads this every day. I said, I have to. It's obligatory. There was a story Father Clement Kubish said one day that there was a priest who was driving late at night. He forgot he had needed to pray Compline. That's the last hour of the day. It takes about 10 minutes to pray. But you have to pray it, unless you have a serious reason why you can't. So he pulled off to the side of the road, way out in the, the sticks, as they say, out in the cornfields, and his cab light didn't work. So he got out of his car, went in front of the headlights, and was kneeling down praying Compline. And here comes the state patrol. <laughs> he rolled his window down, looked at him and said, Mister, that must be a pretty interesting book you're reading there. <laughs> but when we get to praying the rosary, we think of the Gospel of St. Luke, 
When we pray the rosary, the joyful mysteries, we're meditating on things right out of the Gospel of St. Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent to a town to a virgin, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came and he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And Mary pondered what manner of greeting this might be. And, and the angel said, Fear not, Mary, thou hast found grace with God. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bear a son. Mary said, How shall this happen? I know not man, showing her vow of virginity. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. I'm sure that many of you have seen there's a little booklet called the Scripture Rosary. There's a passage from Scripture for every single Hail Mary. Amazing. So when people say, oh, you Catholics don't believe in the Bible, of course we do. As we attend Mass, the first part of the Mass is the Mass of the Catechumen for our instruction. We not only hear the Epistle and Gospel, but we have passages from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and the introit, the gradual. There's so many beautiful things for our inspiration there, right out of sacred scripture. We meditate on the life of Christ. We life, meditate on his passion and death, his resurrection. We meditate on a blessed mother, her beautiful virtues of humility and charity and obedience to the will of God. So when someone says, you know, Catholics don't believe in the Bible, you say, I, I not only read the Bible, I meditate on it. Do you meditate on it? Do you, Mr. Protestant, Miss Protestant, do you meditate on the Bible? Probably not. You read it and say, I'm saved, you know, but not, not, not really ponder the depth of that. Because if they really truly prayed and meditated on sacred scripture, they would know that our Blessed Mother had foretold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And they do not fulfill that prophecy. They do not honor her as she deserves. We honor her with the very words of the angel Gabriel. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. We, we honor our blessed mother with the very words of Elizabeth. Fill with the Holy Ghost. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy woman. How have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And blessed is she, blessed is she, who has believed because the things promised her by the Lord should be accomplished. Elizabeth also speaks in conjunction with the woman we read of in the gospel. Jesus, during his public life, was working miracles and speaking like no man had ever spoken before. And this woman in exuberation is, Blessed art thou among, he says, Blessed is the woman that bore thee in the breast that nursed thee. Jesus said, Yea, rather, Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Our Blessed Mother was indeed blessed to be the mother of God, but she also heard the word of God most faithfully and kept it perfectly. So when we think of the rosary, let us make the time, take the time to pray it well. In our conference downstairs, we're going to talk about the importance of creating, creating in our lives a Catholic atmosphere. You want your children to persevere in the faith, you parents, then you have to create in your homes a Catholic atmosphere. It's not just we're going left and right, up and down, in and out, like Grand Central Station, and we just barely have time to squeeze in the rosary, and when we do it, we're tired, and we're distracted, and we just kind of get it in because we have to. No, we have to make the time, we have to take the time to pray the rosary, to meditate on its mysteries, and to ponder these beautiful events in the life of Jesus and Mary. Remember our salvation. Our salvation depends on our prayer life. If we pray well, God's grace is going to be there and as St. Alphonso Liguori says, if you really pray and persevere in praying, you're going to be saved. And if you don't pray, you're not going to be saved. How important it is that we pray our rosaries well. Our Blessed Mother, how important, she says, is the praying of the rosary. And we should not doubt that. In times of 
very serious crisis in this in the church and in, in society. It was by praying the rosary that Satan and his legions were defeated. And all those who Satan uses to try to destroy souls and to destroy the church. So on this anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima, her final apparition, the beautiful miracle of the sun, as we honor our Blessed Mother today, let us be more and more resolved to pray the rosary every day. And even if we're really busy, we can always pray it while we drive to get in those extra decades here, extra decades there, and make it a reality to pray our rosary every day. No excuses. No excuses. So next time you forgot and you put it off or you didn't schedule it and you're tired, remember my words, no excuses. Let us also do this too. We ought to every day, but especially on major feasts and major anniversaries, thank our Blessed Mother for what we know, the gift of the true faith in these times of apostasy. Just so many people have been led astray and been deceived. And let us also remember, too, if we're going to persevere, then we need to stay close to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Her heart is our refuge. And let us also never forget to live our consecration to Jesus through Mary. Satan, we're no match for him. He's clever. He's deceitful. And you know what? He knows us very well. He knows every temptation, weakness. He knows all those little snares to lead us away from God. And he, he could take all the time he wants if he can bring us down. We are very weak and we have the enemy within our fallen human nature, our self, and the world is so alluring. And especially in this day and age, there's so many occasions of sin is so, how would you say, it's so accessible occasions of sin. We need to have frequent, daily, regular recourse to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, and to our Mother's Immaculate Heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy 